Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. Tonight we'll be talking about how to plan for the future and why. Hey guys, welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, episode regarding hey. wine and the future. I want to welcome my co-host, Alana. How's it? Hey. Our guest tonight is Doug Vinning. Hi, how are you? And I've got Nick Timont from uh, Strandfeld Winery. Well. Thanks very much. Um, tonight, kind of got a, an, a well, let's say a, not weird subject, but kind of a, a mixed subject, but fits in quite nicely. Mm. Um, we're talking about wine in the future, as I said. Um, basically looking at how we do the future, um, the choices we make and how it sets up the future and um, looking at it from a point of view that we actually, the choices we make now mm. actually sets us up to choose our future, if that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, the future doesn't do us, we can actually do we our future. Do we can our create futures. the future yeah. if we're more active in it. Um, and it's all about planning scenarios regarding the future. Now, what we thought the best scenario would be for this show. Like we went through quite a few. I must tell you, <laughs> we sat there like scenario one, scenario Those two. two. Scenario, you know, they've got to go. The best one is. We start, start with wine. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, to me. we've got a bunch of wines here that, um, that Nick brought for us. And um, I think, Doug, you, why don't you start for us? All right. Well, you know. Um, I'm from Future World, and at Future World we have a basic philosophy about the future, and that is that the future shouldn't be something that happens to you. The future should be something that you do. Mm -hmm. So we, we have a kind of slogan for, for what we do in terms of strategic planning for uh, companies, and we say that with understanding you can create and design, you can design and create your future in that order. So it's a, a three-part process, and the first step is to understand what the future could possibly be like. Now, if you ask mm -hmm. me, I'd say the future could be anything. You know, anything's possible in the future. <laughs> anything's possible. And <laughs> I don't believe in forecasting. I think uh, the future is always unexpected. So you should be ready for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. If you prepare yourself to be agile in the face of uncertain events, that gives you a lot of freedom to choose what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Nick, that we have here is from Strandfeld Wines. What? Vineyards, actually. Vineyards, vineyards, yeah. And you brought in some actual wines. Before we get into your story, do you want to tell us maybe just briefly about the Strandfeld Vineyards or the wines and the one that we, we've been tasting? Which we started. Well, let me let me go back a moment and just say how how, how did we arrive at Cape Agulhas, the southern tip of Africa? And uh, es essentially, I was looking for a cool climate, and uh, this is the cheapest land I could find in South Africa with the coolest climate. Yeah. Um, no vineyards had ever been planted there before. We uh, bought the land. It was, a, it was basically a sheep farm, it's sheep and wheat good. farm, 850 hectares in extent, mm -hmm. and uh, very windswept, but it had one essential characteristic, which was a cool climate. And, uh, you want to show them where? Yes, yeah, and turn a little that, way. That is, that is Cape Agullis there. And well, our, our three vineyards are planted here, seven kilometers from the sea. That's good. Up, up there is Bredarsdorp, and Cape Town and Stellenbosch lie that way, about 100 kilometers north of us in a line of latitude. Okay. So we are as far south as you can go. So is a cool climate good for a good wine? So I, I, I believe that you, you produce uh, smaller grapes and tastier grapes, and that, that was the risk we took. To, okay. We had to prove it. Yeah. There were two or three vineyards near us, just to slightly to the north, and I tasted their wines. They were still in early days of production, and it was quite clear that the wine was different. And I thought the combination of a, a unique area, uh, the southern tip of Africa, um, probably going to produce some interesting wines. We chose to grow Sauvignon Blanc, mm -hmm. Pinot Noir and Shiraz, and those are the wines or combinations of those that we're going to drink tonight. Okay, so how did you get into wines? Why, why put a wine from there? Well, my, my career really started in a, a, a formal education with a law, or law qualification, but, and I worked for an Anglo-American corporation for some years 
in, finally in the vineyard side and uh, and Borschendal and Fergelechen, and that got me interested, uh, and and so I th this became a passion of mine. Ten years ago, we bought this land. I didn't buy it on my own. I have a number of friends who they may think stupidly, but they <laughs> they've enjoyed they've enjoyed the ride so far. We've had to fund the money, uh, fund the 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 the, the whole. Um, and production, uh, okay. uh, and we started from scratch, mm. but it's been fun because it's a it's a it's a greenfields operation. There was, as I say, nothing there before, and uh, we had a we had a dream, and the dream was to produce some superb wines. The Adamasta, which the white wine which we're drinking tonight, is a five star wine in platter in the latest platter. Uh, it's it's won us a lot of credibility. Okay. And uh, th that is the proof of the pudding. At ten years after buying the land, we've produ managed to produce that. That's a five-star wine, and the other two Strandfeld wines are four and a half stars each. Okay, wow. So, Doug, you you actually blog about wines, don't you? Yes. One of the other things I do, besides working with Future World um, and being on Twitter and all that sort of thing, <laughs> one of the other things I do is I, I do review wines um, on online, and it's called a real-time wine. This was a, a project um, that Andy Hadfield started, and there are a bunch of us, we call the winos, who, <laughs> who do the reviews uh, in real time. So just now I'll put out a tweet, which will be a review of the wine that we're tasting now. And that goes onto our blog and also goes onto Facebook. We normally also capture a, a picture of the bottle or the label so that people can see exactly what it is we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But I, I won't do that right now. I'll, I can follow that up later. Yeah. Um, so the idea is, behind real-time wine, is that we review wine in ordinary language. So we don't use any of these fancy what do we uh, call it? Wine? wanky wine words as wanky Andy wine words. words. <laughs> so we actually even have a, a list of banned words on our blog. If you go to realtimewine.coza, you'll see the banned words. So you're not allowed to say tannin and nose and all these things like that, which ordinary people probably don't even understand. Mm. It's so lacquer, you mean a lacquer wine? Yes. A lacquer wine. <laughs> <laughs> For wine's lacquer, we say it's lacquer. <laughs> if it tastes this. like turpentine, we say it tastes like turpentine. Fair, fair. Tell so us about this one then. This Adamaster, Adamaster this is now a very prestigious wine, and of course we don't want to insult our, our host who's brought it for us to taste. <laughs> but it is certainly, <laughs> Just be real, I think. It certainly <laughs> is unusual. Now, this, this is a blend of um, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. And you can pick up uh, various characteristics of those. It's not very fruity, which you sometimes do get with the semillon. This one is much more, um, it's a clean, I would say a clean and strong sort of flavor. It's got a little bit of vanilla, I think, and a bit of oakiness from the, the semillon, which has been in barrels, and perhaps a hint of grassiness um, uh, from the Sauvignon Blanc. Mm. Okay. So what do you think about it, Jack? Well, <laughs> the best way I could put it is, um, I don't know what wanky w wine words would be, but to me it's a smooth, easily drinkable wine. Um, and you could easily drink too much of it <laughs> because it's really good. <laughs> That'll be my, my review on it. Yeah. Um, well, what gives me pleasure in this wine is that we've called it Adamasta, which is uh, a, a Portuguese believed that there was a God living on Table Mountain and, and that this God was basically the wind that hits us every year in about October. Yeah. So when we have a good Adamasta season, the wine is excellent. <laughs> uh, this wine is, is, is a nice wine. I, I think, uh, to be fair, we should be having this wine with food. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it, it, goes, it combines with lots of different foods very well because it's actually a serious wine. Uh, it's definitely it's, a serious one. It's thirteen and, and, and a half and, percent alcohol. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not a. It's not a. It's not a. You know, it's not a, a wine that you would sip before lunchtime. I think you'd have it at a meal and enjoy it. And that's the way I do. I yeah. enjoy it like that. So, so one of the one of the things we we're talking about tonight is the future and scenario planning. Yeah. And just to focus a little bit on um, on the wine farm, we, you spoke about it a little bit, um, but there's quite a story regarding the actual thought process behind it and the choosing of it and let's say the scenario planning regarding actually getting to where you want why did you choose that well how did you how did you make those decisions and well why? i was keen uh, after i'd uh, worked with and set up fagelechen 
um, I was involved with Bushard Finlayson, which was just outside of Manus. And, and that already has showed me him on Otter Valley uh, it produces some really wonderful wines, and it has a cool wind coming up that valley. Mm. So I, I felt that we should find something f- further south which could also have a cool, a cool wind. And we, 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 we found this, this farm that I referred to earlier. Um, we then did uh, numerous uh, test holes. We decided to make an offer to buy it. I then had to raise the capital. Uh, I put together a prospectus with the, with the help of a small merchant bank, um, and I went to a number of friends, and uh, <laughs> stupid, <laughs> stupidly or cleverly, depends so how you look at it, they, they've, invested, they've in f- followed their investment, and we started something from scratch. And we had a dream that in about 10 years, which we're getting to now, hmm. we would be in a position to be in full production. Well, we're not quite in full production. We're at about this year we planned this coming, this coming vintage, which will be 2012, uh, we'll probably produce about 300, 280, 300 tons of grape, depending wow. on Adamasto, of course. Yeah. Uh, here's the, uh, here's you, the wild card. How we feel about it. <laughs> but that's, that's the size of the production. Okay. Y- and it's, so it's, it's become a reality. We have a, 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 a Strandfeld label, which is our first label, and then we have the first sighting, which is the second label. And the first sighting refers to Diosh going around the southern tip of Africa in 1487. And I thought... As he plant a, pa- a padreo right on the on the beach somewhere near Cape Bagalus, it was appropriate to sort of recognise the Portuguese discovery. Yeah. Now, now I'd like to just pick up on what you said there because you said it depends on Adamasta, depends what happens in the season. Mm-hmm. Now that is precisely the kind of thing that we talk about at Future World. We say to people, you can't forecast with any kind of certainty because it's mm-hmm. impossible. What many people try and do is they take what happened last year the bu- and then their budget for next year is what happened last year plus 10% yeah. and they hope for a nice stable growth. That's not, re- that's not reality. Reality is unpredictable mm. and full of, of un- un- random events that have a profound effect. We call these things black swans, things that completely change the status quo and usually catch you by surprise. So okay. if the wind comes and blows your crop away, that certainly catches you by surprise. And the only way to deal with that is to first of all kind of – foresee that this could happen, anything could possibly happen, and then also to be agile, to be able to, to, to have the agility in your planning, to be able to respond in, in some kind of positive way. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you then know what the, well, let's call it the worst could be? Because that's kind of what you're looking at, isn't it? Or what would you say? Well, well you not describe? necessarily. You know, if, if, if you always focus on a worst-case scenario, you end up being a pessimist, and then you know you're going <laughs> to lock yourself away and hide under the duvet, and nothing's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So we we always tend to have an optimistic view of the future. So we we say, well, just think about it. You know, what what could happen? You know, especially in in terms of innovation, almost anything is possible. Mm. And we've got a, a few scenarios that we can talk about tonight. Um, um, we we also publish um, every week on a Thursday. We publish an electronic newsletter, if you like, called Mind Bullets. Now, mind bullets, <laughs> mind bullets are new stories from the future. So, so the one that uh, is coming out th- this week on Thursday will be a story from a few years' time, or maybe it'll be ten years ahead, uh, and that will be the actual dateline on the story. And then the story will be some kind of probable or, or possible scenario uh, about um, some uh, something that happens in the future. Let's look at one of the examples. Sorry. Can I, uh, I just want to know, how do you guys come up with these ideas, though? Where do you <laughs> well, <laughs> you know well the red on. wine helps, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, it is, it is a little bit uh, creative. But we do, we scan trends. We're continuously looking on the Internet and uh, scanning what's happening, especially in technology, but also in politics, um, social, cultural trends, um, you know, things like the environmental movement, all that sort of thing. Okay. Well, if I can just butt in there. Yeah. Um, Ten years ago when we started, I didn't envisage I would be talking on a program <laughs> like this. I thought I would be walking from one supermarket to the other trying to sell my wine. Uh, okay. But, but uh, there's no doubt. I, I read a book called The Long Tail, I think it's called. But it's a very interesting book because the, uh, we can reach private individuals at their home and they can buy on the Internet. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very, very exciting development, and that is the future. Mm. And uh, it's not the future; it's today. It's today, <laughs> today actually. Yeah. Yeah. And I've yeah. even got to learn to Twitter. I've got to do do all sorts of things, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about it. Yeah. 
but and uh, so knowing that that's one of the that's part of the future, you're already yes, getting yes. Your so I'm, I must, with it. I must actually in first sightings on I must, Facebook. I must example. take it on and, yeah, it is, yeah. and and we must get to those individuals via people like yourself yeah. who talk about the wine and and that the fact that they can go onto the internet and I can de- deliver the wine I know I can in Johannesburg within 24 hours of the order mm. getting, getting to me. I mean, that, that's fantastic. Mm. That is, that is Ten years ago, I couldn't do that. Absolutely, yeah. and this is another part of the thing is the, the rapid pace, the accelerating pace of this kind of change. I mean, ten years ago, as you say, you couldn't even think of a scenario like that. Now, it's commonplace. This is how people do business in, in niche markets. Yeah. It's absolutely yeah. the, 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 the fact. And I know some we, of have, we have a, an internet, sorry to interrupt you, okay. we have yeah. an internet based uh, agent in Germany. So if I want, if my children want wine in, 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 in London or something, they, can, they, they, they just send an, e- send an email and the wine arrives the next day. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. So for those overseas changed. people, you can uh, order some wine. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, some of your mind bullets have actually, you know, a couple of years ago that you predicted have actually come true. Or very close to to those scenarios that you thought might. This this mm-hmm. is this is in fact um, true. Um, when when we construct the mind blue scenarios, we don't try and make them too outrageously ridiculous because then they're just pure fiction. Mm-hmm. So we do we do look at trends and things, and we say, well, look, this this might not be likely, but it it it's, it could happen. And if it did, what would be the impact on businesses today? I mean, some of these things can be quite profound. Now we didn't. Um, predict the, the tsunami that hit Japan, but uh, neither did they. And yeah. I don't think their scenario planning was adequate because mm. I understand they planned, they said, well, what's the most likely scenario? The most likely scenario was a tsunami that didn't exceed six meters. Well, they got hit by one of 14 meters, which was far greater. So, And, and if they, they had looked at the scenario 14 meters, I think we had a conversation that the, they would have put their – Diesel, what's it? Um, diesel generators, generators somewhere else. Yeah, somewhere in the top of a mountain, maybe, or something else. And it actually would have prevented them. Could have, could have. have um, we're not entirely out. sure about all the, the factors that went into that absolute mm. disaster, but but that's just a, an example of how something that is highly unlikely can still happen yeah. and ha- can have a major a effect. Swan. I mean, that's an absolute black swan. It was unlikely. It was random. It took everyone by surprise. And not only that, the, the effects are. Profound. It's completely changed the the outlook on the nuclear um, power industry worldwide. So I think what, what for me was very interesting about that story is even though they they predicted the possibility of a of a tsunami, they didn't predict the the extent, the extent of, of the of tsunami an, of an unusual, of one, unusual exactly. one. Exactly, so that's, that's the point. To me, it's, it's useful. Like you may think this could be my future and this mm. is what I want to plan, mm. but what if it went extreme? What if it was extreme? You know, extremely successful. This goal that I'm going towards. Yeah, I think my question is always then: you obviously got to, you got to, you got to have these scenarios that you plan for, but then you got to weigh it up against cost, though. Sure, but that's 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 the the risk, though. That's the the problem with conventional planning is you say, well, what is the most likely with the best impact, and then we'll go with that, yeah, because yeah. that costs the least or something. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you've actually got to be careful of that, and and. You've actually got to be a bit courageous and say, well, you know, but is this, could this happen? Could, could we produce the best wine that anyone's ever seen and sell out completely at three times the price of anyone else? And, and say to yourself, realistic, well, well, maybe we could. And if it did, would we know how to capitalize on that situation? Yeah. And so it might not be the, the most likely outcome, but, but you could at least plan – to have whatever it is, the right equipment or the right investment in the processes so that you could deal with that in, in a positive way. So, um, And then then you could decide, well, actually, that would give you a market advantage to do precisely that, that to that to be that kind of a niche operator, and then go for that, you know, mm. to capitalize on that scenario of the long tail that you were talking about. Yeah. And you see, uh, 10 years ago, China was not a market that we knew much about. It's now overtaken America as the largest wine market in the world. Oh, really? And uh, okay. that's dramatic. But I want to just pick up on this word tsunami. I mean, we have a tsunami of unemployment in this country. And uh, it's something that all of us need to be aware of and, and do that's something well put, about it and plan for it because it's, it's a serious problem. Yeah. Mm. And one of our other scenarios for the future is all these um, AIDS orphans that we've got. You know, the two million AIDS orphans, that, that is the future. We have a whole, so many children growing up with our parents. Yeah, that is going to affect our future. Those are very real scenarios. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but, but the future impacts of that? Yes. Have, are we really dealing with possible... Probably not. Well, probably not. So tell us a bit about the, the red wine. Red wine we've got here. We've spoken... What you, I Doug, you, you, you do, you're the expert. <laughs> I'm not the <laughs> expert. I, I, I'm, I was, just, I I'm just, you I'm the just a simple and investor. <laughs> no, you're, no, you're the, you're a wine farmer. You're an expert. I'm just a wine drinker. Mine this, <laughs> this is uh, the the uh, Syrah, which, in fact, uh, what I had in mind, uh, the, the vineyards that we've planted to, uh, are, are obviously uh, Shiraz vineyards. Uh, Syrah is the word that they use in, in France, and we, we wanted to differentiate this from the first sighting, which is a Shiraz. It sounds a bit complicated, but it's the same thing. But it has its, its components are Mervert, which is a red grape, Grenache, which is a red grape, and Viognier, which is a, a white grape with quite a, a, a sort of peachy apricot flavor, and very small proportions, 5%. Of that, of that blend is is not Syrah, and that's what you're tasting. But you, maybe you should give an opinion of the wine because yeah. I'm I'm just the maker, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll I'll give a. You can say what you like. Sure, and I will. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like the whole Real time. Real time. Real time exactly critique. It, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I find this quite an unusual wine. Um, Although it's mainly Shiraz or Syrah, if you like, um, which is more or less the same thing, it's um, it's very very spicy. I f- if I was um, tweeting about this wine, I'd say it uh, it tastes like a cardamom and cayenne pepper laced with ether. It's extremely <laughs> spicy and volatile, <laughs> which doesn't it's not necessarily bad because I mean the whole thing about wine is everyone's got their own taste, yeah. and mm-hmm. what appeals to me might not appeal to you, and so, and, and vice versa. So does it appeal to you? Um, as I said, it's very unusual. It's got intense, volatile, spicy flavors. I think it's um, it's quite strong. It's about fourteen percent alcohol. I think it's the it's the kind of wine that probably grows on you rather than grabs you right away. In in my in my terms, as I said, when I first tasted it, it was quite quite surprising. Okay. So I, thi- <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say something else that. that, that Grows in it. I'd love to talk about one of the mind bullets. So one of the yeah. possible future scenarios. The one was um, about a droid. So yeah, tell us a bit about. Uh, uh, sorry, Tanani. It's the prediction. one you. <laughs> <laughs> the one you were talking about. Sorry. The, um, basically, the uh, uh, robot knowing what you're thinking. Right. Well, okay. This is actually not as far fetched as it sounds. This is uh, set in the year 2020, which is fairly far ahead. In fact. It was written probably last year or something, so it's looking forward about 10 years. But in fact, it's, it's not that far-fetched at all. The first thing is that we all know that the Japanese are great at um, building advanced robots. They seem to have, be absolutely obsessed with, with humanoid-style robots. So I used a, a Japanese scenario. Um, and the, the other thing that um, uh, when we're putting this mind bullet together is the advances that have been made in actually reading brain waves. So you can now actually already get a a wireless headset that you simply put on your head quite easily without having to implant electrodes in your brain or anything, and you can train a computer to read your brain waves so that various actions can be done just by thinking about them, like turning on the lights or reading your, you know, flipping the page on a book or whatever, that sort of thing. Mm. And I've actually seen these demonstrated. You can see it on YouTube where someone... um, and navigates in a motorized wheelchair simply by thinking about it through one of these headsets uh, and operating a computer, even simple things like making a mouse cursor move, things like that. So that's actually real time what's happening right it's now? Real time happening today, in fact, already last year. So taking that one step further, um, I believe the Japanese actually have a project where for um, aged and infirm people, and of course they have a big problem with an aging population. Uh, there aren't really enough caregivers and, and companions to um, um, to help uh, people like that. So if you could take one of these advanced robots and um, give it a connection to a brain-computer interface, so if someone was disabled or something like that, they wouldn't even have to operate a control. They could simply think, summon that. Think it, basically. They could simply think about being helped, and the, the robot would help them. I know they're already building uh, androids that take care of the elderly and help them uh, with voice commands and stuff as far as I'm aware. That, that's the yeah, idea. That's, that's happening. Hmm. So one of the other videos that we had was of um, the Honda, and this was 
good couple of years ago where they, where they actually got the the robots to run, which was at that time groundbreaking technology. Um, I think it was it was amazing. They had the it had the movement to to mimic the way the way yeah, humans the same run. running that's, motion. Yeah, that's <laughs> the Honda Azimo robot, which is quite amazing. The, as I said, the Japanese seem to be obsessed with humanoid robots. I I think most of the robots that we will um, uh, find more commonplace or more productive in society and, and business and so on will actually be more like the industrial robots that build cars these days and that yes. sort of thing okay. um, rather than humanoid type robots uh, although I could be wrong but uh, the, there's all sorts of robots the military are great at, at, at deploying robots they've got all sorts of robots for going in and dismantling bombs and all that sort of thing mm. and of course it's <laughs> Uh, funnily, we're talking about that. That's another uh, thing that they're going to have to use to clean up the mess at uh, the Fukushima nuclear reactor is robots because it's just too dangerous for people to go in there. Um, so, so there's definitely a place for robots in the future. Absolutely. <laughs> My, the the eco-skeleton you mentioned, is that... What was that? <laughs> <laughs> is, is sound that effects coming from <laughs> Tim. <laughs> Yeah, that's, another, oh, that's, yeah that's another military robot. You see, now yeah, it's it quite an dog. interesting <laughs> one. It's it's a, a robot, a, a legged robot wow, that can yeah, carry quite a lot of weight. Only it problem it makes a hell of a noise. No, it's got automatic balancing Look sensors. That. That's intense. You can also climb, climb over rocks and all the rest of it and maintain it's, its balance. And if it slips, yeah. it can right itself up again. And you see, so something like that could go in if someone was injured, mm. you could send one of those uh, through uh, rugged terrain and under fire to take uh, medical Pick supplies or you know ammunition oh, or whatever yeah. or, or yeah. help them out or whatever. So, so um, you know, the, the military are, are, have got obviously got their sights on robots. And that's what one of the the mind bullets is about the um, the bandages. Tell us about that. This, uh, what was it? Smart bandages Smart saving bandages. soldiers' lives. Yeah, that's also said in the future, but not very far ahead. I think it's uh, only a, a few Yeah, That's uh, set in 2013, just in a couple of years' time. Now, the idea there is that um, with nanotechnology, more and more uh, things are possible at a, at a molecular level. So you can have, for example, um, drug capsules that are connected to microscopic sensors. And so that um, they only release the, the drugs you need, whether they're painkillers or antibacterial, so only when they detect the, the presence of that bacteria. So you can have much more targeted things. You can have things that respond to specific situations. The other, um, the other idea of the smart bandages was to have a, a bandage where the sensors are, are, are so um, small that they can be wrapped in a flexible um, coating mm. but still have a wireless connection. Mm. So you could, for example, if someone uh, fell and broke their leg or was shot and wounded or whatever, you could wrap a bandage around them and the bandage could like, take an x-ray almost, could almost image the, <laughs> the wound yes. and put and it through it to, 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 the a, yeah, to the hospital so the doctor's laptop, he can see exactly what's going on and he can then wirelessly so tell the bandage to give this kind of drug or whatever. It's phenomenal. crazy. So, so what I mean, like, when, but looking at some of these scenarios for, that are possible futures, it not only helps us, like, plan, you know, w what we need to do, but al almost for me it sparks off ideas. Yes. So are, we fi are you finding that people are more creative now in the present because of uh, well, thinking about what the different futures Well, that's, a, that's, an, ab that's an absolute fact, is that um, the, whole, the whole idea of innovation and technology and even civilization in general accelerates through communication because we can share ideas ideas only become better when they mix with other mm. ideas so mm. the sharing of mm. ideas which is becoming easier and easier all the time globally that makes us gives us the ability to create even better ideas even better futures yes, for ourselves yeah. if impact the actual future yeah one thing i wanted to touch on was in this these kind of scenario planning um <coughs> mindsets that we have one of the one of the examples that i that i quite liked or i think is quite fascinating is where darren brown plays nine champion chess players um where he actually goes <laughs> and he beats four of them draws two of them and only loses to three of them thereby basically beating the group of these the grandmasters grand grand yeah. chess players and um Doug, if you kind of want to touch on that, because I know you know about it as well. I, I do, and I think that kind of backs up what I was saying, because he is actually using 
the, the, the skill of the chess masters to help him beat the other chess masters. So he was you, milking their ideas, if you like, their, their skill, their knowledge against mm. each other so um, by like playing a pivotal role. Yeah. Took the, the one knowledge from one guy and then applied it in his future to the next guy and took that knowledge and applied it in real time. Yeah, <laughs> in real time. <laughs> you know what's interesting if you um, to go back to wine because I don't know yes. much about what you guys are talking about. <laughs> Bring slightly wine behind me, but I've been to wine cellars in this country and elsewhere in America which are fantastically high tech. Mm. Mm. Uh, every computer device you can think of and yet I've been in wine cellars in Burgundy, in France, where they are as simple as it can be, and they make better wines. Yeah. And so, you, you know, technology is good, but there are some things that just work better. I think it's applied knowledge, if, if, yeah, if that's the right word. I, I, think, I, I think it's true. You know, I mean, technology is not the answer to everything, but it certainly helps a lot. For example, it helps to, you to sell your niche wines to, to people in China who suddenly now are multimillionaires. Now, on the other hand, I think generally you'll probably find worldwide, worldwide more people should produce better wine than they did 200 years ago because there are more people who've learned more about producing wine from people who have that knowledge and skill, and so it's permeated across more areas in the world. So, so I certainly think sharing the knowledge is still, to me, key to improving the overall standard of what we have. Yeah, I think the technology itself plays a role. Mm. Um, but if you look at, I think, the, the things you guys have learned, as you described with the actual, the actual soil and the rocks. Um, well, we have a weather station on the farm, and I think I can go onto the Internet and tell you what the wind is doing, what the temperature is, what the humidity is. It stands there. It works off a satellite system. Wow. It's, uh, you know, but it records every throughout the year and is one of the weather stations supplying the wine uh, technology people because they're trying to find out what's happening and it's it's amazing actually when you yeah. think about that yeah it's that applied knowledge i think that that helps us create the, the futures that we want the wine that we want yeah um, it gives us those choices more information as you say to to make choices now <coughs> to head towards the you know five star yeah. wines that we want to produce any uh doug any last <coughs> words on the wine that we have here tonight um, I, I think it's it's great wine. It's very high quality, um, and I look forward to tasting the whole range to see which one appeals to me the most. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have six bottles here. We've we've opened two of them. Um, so the other four, I'm not sure what's going to happen with them after the show, but we'll see. <laughs> I'll do my best to review them on real time wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, um, I think just to recap on tonight, um, I think our understanding of of of, of what we did tonight apart from looking at wine and tasting the wine, which was ab absolutely great. Mm. Um, the idea of looking at strategies, uh, scenarios, and how they can influence our futures and how we can, I guess, profit from it or g gain from it the way we want to, I guess is what we're getting from, from, from both of you guys tonight, um, setting ourselves up for what we want in our futures and seeing what the choices are to get us there. Um, yeah, and, and, and looking at some of the different scenarios that there could be ahead for, for each of us individually as well as obviously collectively in businesses or in, as a country and that it can spark off. For me, it was just like my brain is a spark of creativity now. So so if that is possible, I mean, one of the things we didn't speak about is like Google cars, like, you know, yeah. they drive without drivers in them. We were talking just now about… If that's yeah. possible, then, then, you know, I could create a whole business where I sit in the back of the car running the business and, and the, the car, car drives, drives me around. everywhere <laughs> I need to go. And it's so, not so only possible, actually, it's actually happening. It's happening. Mm. Nevada, the state of mm. Nevada today announced that um, driverless cars would be uh, legal in, uh, in the state of Nevada. I think there it's a go. massive so, step forward. So imagine the, the business opportunities if you could – you don't have to drive the car. Exactly. So to me, it just it opens up a whole range of possible futures and – is it, so that's yeah, one of my things, I think, is just looking at the different scenarios. Not only do you, are you able to plan better now, but it can actually just start come up with ideas that get you to shape and create a different future. Yeah, it gives you the more choices and yeah, it, it creates those choices for you and I guess in turn gives you more certainty about where you're going. Mm. There's and, tremendous uncertainty, but 
if you're uncertain, then you have freedom of choice. And we, we like to say at Future World, we like to say that the future is not a matter of chance, but a matter of choice. Choice, yeah. I like that. I like that. Guys, and I Nick, to so just sorry, from, from your experience, is there any w- pulls of wisdom just from how you've looked at the future and now done so well with your wines? Well, so what, what we did learn is that markets have changed. Okay. And and consumers have changed, and the and the, there are a whole lot of new challenges, and it's it's you can't uh, up, rip, rip up your vineyards every three years to to meet new consumer tastes. So you've you've really got to be in for the long haul. Mm-hmm. A vineyard is basically twenty five years investment. Okay, uh, and you've got to look at that and build your base around uh, being excellent at what you do. Guys, I want to thank you. Um, I think Thanks tonight was so exciting. Well. I enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Doug, thank you, Nick. Wine Talana. and the future. Thanks, Thanks Jake. Jake. Thanks, thank Talana. you so much. Better. Thanks, Tony. Um, we'll yeah. So two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. We'll be back with our next show. And, wine. and we, let's talk uh, geeks tomorrow night. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about so, guys, thank you and once again, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. And cheers. Yeah, cheers. Don't send it to my shareholder. <laughs> They're all watching, didn't you know? They're going to find it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm going to email Rupert and say, uh, 35 million this ran down the line. <laughs> Guys. <laughs> Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. We're talking about how to plan for the future and why. Yeah? Yep. Cool. Look at the camera. Can't remember. Look at me. Look at me. Talana. Me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, I was going to say something. Or right. oh, Nick. But yeah, Talana preferably. Yeah, yeah. Oh, me. Yes, you don't want me to talk now, do you? No, no, no. no, 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 no. He's just doing an intro, but uh, okay. we, we cut him at the beginning of the video. <laughs> when you're ready. Bye for. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility. Tonight we're talking about. Play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the future. Welcome to this place in tonight's show. We're talking about the future <laughs> and like, why? Like nice Buddha and old Darren. <laughs> All right. On the other hand, Darren, how about the future? <laughs> Alrighty. Okay. Let's try it again. Are you going to come here again or just yep. go?